All right. We, uh, we always... We always try to share with you uh, the encouragement that we get from around the country and around the world since we're on the internet. Uh, we're on the internet all over the world. And of course, if you're on the internet, you're all over the world. And uh, we're uh, live streaming right now, and we get responses from uh, Europe and Ireland and down in South America and so forth. And from around the country, since we're on about 200 different towns and cities. And I got a letter here from Sheila West down in Louisiana. Got an email. She says, Hi, Jim. Hope this finds you and Mary well. As for me, since the car wreck, I've had a lot of pain in my shoulders and my neck. I have to go to therapy, physical therapy, and pain management. I just found some time to listen to this man, Charles Jennings, dot truth in history. I've found him to be an error on some important issues. Have not listened to all his teachings yet. He is an Anglo-Israelist. That's racism. Uh, tonight, I listened to the Man of Sin 2 series. I found much to consider in what he is to say. Since you teach, and I know it is truth, the Bible is written to the church. I have always had a problem with this man of sin being outside the church realm and one man having the influence and power the Bible says he will demonstrate. I believe what Jennings is saying makes good sense. Well, he, he teaches false doctrine, but even false teachers will say something that makes sense once in a while. You have to be careful what you hear. Uh, come soon, Lord Jesus. Uh, Sheila. Uh, then John Newell writes to us. He's up in New York. Uh, hello, all at Grace and Truth. Hope you continue the well way. Thank God for everything. We had fellowship tonight, Saturday night. Eight souls present, including my son Andrew. We continued in our study of the gospel and the stars, still looking at the seed, branch, and virgin. An intense study that helps us to see many familiar verses in a different light. We also look at reaper and shepherd in the Virgo constellation. Christ is the grim reaper and the good shepherd as seen in Matthew thirteen twenty four through 43 and Matthew 25, 31 through 46. We also looked at Rebecca as the church, the virgin, in Genesis 24. God willing, we'll continue in this way. Grace and peace, John. We love you, John. And then uh, uh, got a letter from Joel Rinkhausen. Uh, he says, I could not and would not try to explain my words. I really have no explanation. I guess it is like Jim says that Yahweh creates the peace and he creates evil. I can only apologize uh, and meditate on what lesson I am being taught. Not that you could know me, but it is completely out of character for me to debate or argue. Venom sputum is strange and alien to my usual personality. I just got all my utilities turned on two weeks ago. Water, gas, electricity, and so forth. Was disabled in 2008 and was terminated from my job because, because of it. And he writes on and says, I sincerely apologize upsetting Jim, Mary, and anyone else that have felt offended was not my conscience intent. So don't worry, I won't be, I won't write anymore. I'll just listen. Oh, okay. Uh, Robert Taylor, I don't guess this is the actor since he's dead. Uh, it's an old actor for any of those that didn't know. Uh, Jim Brown, several months ago, I sent you an email suggesting the printing of Jim Brown's study Bible. Oh, good grief. Have you begun this project yet? No. If not, please do so. Thank you. No, I don't believe anybody can really write. I, just, I believe people are very arrogant to start writing when they're young. Because when you get old, you find out how wrong you were about a lot of things when you were young. I've, I've read some men that said, I'm so embarrassed for having written things. When I was 30 and 35 years old, I found out I didn't know what I was doing. Well, 
I think that's very presumptuous, thinking you can comment on every verse in the Bible. That is very presumptuous. I don't think anybody should have a study Bible that comments on every verse. It takes a commentary, and it takes a whole bunch of guys getting together, even to contribute, and you're going to have a lot of error in it. Uh, I use commentaries, but I don't believe everything I read in commentaries. Uh, Gerald Ryan writes to us, Wow, thank you for your willingness to send a DVD to me. I don't have a DVD player, unfortunately. But if it will be archived online, I can watch it there. I'm impressed by the scholarship. Again, I haven't gotten into any doctrinal things so far. I've only watched Jim's videos on textual criticism, which I think should be starting point for exegesis. God bless Gerald. Uh, and he wrote another down here. It's a long one. I won't read anymore. Just keep watching. Uh, David Rogery writes to us, and he's been up in Pennsylvania, up in Philadelphia. Hello, all at Grace and Truth Ministries. God has put a new turn in our lives. I was laid off yesterday from my job here in Philadelphia. After two years of work, thanks be to God, I also have found a new job back in Houston. He moved there from Houston. David's from France originally. So God sends us back to where we are coming from. Thanks be to him again. Our family will be closer together, which is great. Now, now excited or not to go back there, this is the will of our Father, and we are thankful for it. All things work together for good to them that love God. No complaints. Uh, I could not find a job, but I did... Certainly, zero complain. We will, we will be driving down there December 31st and get there in the 4th of January. I guess I will get my Texan accent back now. Your Texas French accent. You didn't sound Texan to me when you were up here from there. And drop the Northeastern accent. Forget, Excuse me. forget the French accent i can't forget that we look we love you all and we'll keep you posted on where and when we are back and running in houston agape Kristen and david we love you guys just keep plugging away chuck nolan i'm not afraid of an army of lions led by sheep i'm afraid of an army of sheep led by a lion Alexander the Great. Cheers, Grant. Mm. Huh? No. Oh, that's a quote from Alex the Great. All right. That'll be... I got some phone, phone calls. I'll just tell you who's called us. Uh, Margaret Mosley from Winchester, Tennessee... Got a call from uh, Demetrius Proctor, Washington, D.C., uh, Bill Howell, Yukon, Oklahoma, uh, from Mike Richardson, Oklahoma City, Billy Freeman, Norman, Oklahoma. Oklahoma's been calling a lot. Uh, Jeff Morrison, Washington, D.C., Frederico Romero, Denver, Colorado, Jane Bravo, Tucson, Arizona, uh, Taylor Brim, Rockingham, North Carolina. Donovan French down in Louisiana. Uh, Tony from Nashville, Tennessee. Rick Stewart, Albany, New York. And then we got letters from uh, the Teals from Vider, Texas, from Dan Hawk, our brother down in Palm Coast, Florida, and Dwayne Germany down in in Birmingham, Alabama. That'll be enough reading for right now. And uh, let me remind you of our regular announcements. If you live in the Nashville area, uh, watch us on channel. And we're on radio. Oh, excuse me. Uh, if you're in Hendersonville on channel 3, and we're on radio every Saturday morning, WNQM 1300 on the dial. Uh, 
and uh, remember our needy people. We, we have a bunch of needy folks that are trying to stay alive in life, just trying to pay bills and, and just struggling with life. If you want to help our poor needy believers, uh, send a check to Grace and Truth and put benevolent fund on the bottom of it for the needy. And uh, if you want to, if, or you can send a food card. I call them food cards or gift cards. You can pick one up at, at a drugstore or the grocery store. And uh, we'll get these right into the hands of the people. Uh, you can pick up a Walmart card, a Visa card for $20, $40, whatever you want to do. And uh, remember, we support, if you send a check, be sure and put what it's for on the bottom of it. So it goes to those needy people. Uh, what am I forgetting? Anybody sick? Huh? Yeah, Martha down in, uh, Martha Bruggerman down in, uh, in Texas, down in College Station. We've been talking to her a lot, and she's struggling with heart disease, and I don't know what all, do you know what's, got an, has, needs an operation, she's just struggling, so pray God will give her strength to get through this, and we love you, Martha. And Jim, too. Love you guys. Uh, we got any visitors that's never been here? Is any, everybody's been here? Who's that? Your wife. We're glad to have you. We got water back there. Restrooms over here. And we're glad to have you. That is Philip, isn't it? Who is that? Huh? Vince. Vince. Oh, Vince. I did gosh, Vince. Your hair's got gray. You grew a beard. <laughs> Goodness gracious. You sure did, didn't you? We're glad to have y'all here. Glad to see everybody here. Uh, well, let's go to the Lord in prayer and... Uh, Pray for me. I get kind of down at times. I'm kind of down right now, but I'll preach anyway. Uh, we all go through it. It's my turn. As we pray, uh, Eric, you want to pray for us, please? Amen. I think I'm ready. Oh, besides that, Vince, you've gained about 20 pounds. You gained at least 10. Huh? Oh, yeah. Okay. It's nice to have a good cook. I've got a good cook. Huh? Hmm. Yeah, yeah, Mary Big Dipper. <laughs> Mary Big Dipper. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> Mary Big Dipper. It's Sunday morning, and we're, our subject has been in the book of Revelation. That's moved us into prophecy. Prophecy and Christmas are directly related. Christmas is Christ's Mass. It's Roman Catholicism. Uh, the Mass is eating human flesh. When the priest raised the Eucharist up, they uttered those words, Hocus corpus eum fili. And it, they say that that literally turns 
and changes in the to the body of Christ. Hocus corpus. That's where the magicians get hocus pocus, presto changeo comes from the same thing. Even every dictionary, every word study book will tell you that. So they're saying that this cracker and grape juice turns into the literal body of Christ, and there's been more people that have died over this very thing than any other controversy in the church, in the history of the church. Uh, it's over the sacrament of the Mass. Uh, the Mass is the focal point of all Roman Catholicism. The, the confessional, the rosary is all secondary. The main thing is the Mass eating the literal body of Christ. And that's the Christ Mass. The festival of the Mass was a seven-day period from December the 17th through December the 24th. And that was a period called the Feast of Saturn in Rome in the ancient world. Constantine was about to lose the empire to these rampaging hordes rampaging across the European continent. And while they were doing that, uh, the, the uh, uh, Constantine said, I've got to do something about this. In 325 AD at the Nicene Council, he said, I will amalgamate their sun and tree gods or their fire gods, their fire gods and their tree goddesses. I'll, I will... I'll amalgamate those into this feast of Saturn, that that feast of Saturn, or it's called the Saturnalia. And that Saturnalia was, it was also called the festival, festival of the Lord of Misrule. And what they would do, they would exchange, they would take the king and go find a bum on the street I find a man who was a fool and make him the king and make the king the bum on the street. They would exchange roles in life. Well, that's why they called it the festival of the Lord of Misru. Well, you had at the feast of Saturn, you had a king that, that ruled for seven days from December the 17th through the 24th. And of course, the reason for this, the reason for this, and I put this on the board before, but we're moving towards Christmas this is what prophecy is all about. This was a time period when you get to the 21st of December. That is called the winter solstice. I'm putting this on the board. I put it on several times, but I put it on, and I'm going to put it, I put it on again this morning for a particular reason. Uh, this is the winter solstice, and that is, that is the longest nights of the year, December the 21st. As you come from summer, the sun begins to wane, and the way it wanes, it turns on its axis. Uh, the northern hemisphere uh, is, as the sun goes, as the earth goes around the sun, when the, when the axis, well, let me put it like, that'll be fine, I guess. When the, when you have the sun, when you have the northern hemisphere closest to the sun, like here, that is the summer. And as it goes through its axis, it, as it goes through its elliptical path, it gets around here to the where the northern hemisphere is further away from the sun, and that's winter. And as you move towards that, that is, uh, you go from summer to fall to winter, and you come back around to spring, spring, and then summer again. Well, this is the same thing as the, as what we call the uh, Big Dipper in its four phases. Here's the Big Dipper. Right north of the earth is Polaris. Polaris, or the North Star, directly above earth, straight towards the north is the North Star. Well, what the old pagans did, they watched the Big Dipper go through its four phases, and they called this the wheel of the year. And they said someone had to be turning that so they could get from fall through the hard winters all the way back around to spring. And the main points on this that we're going to look at was Samhain. That's as you're going to fall. It looks like Samhain, but it's Samhain. And Yule down here. This was, this is, if you notice, it is the swastika, or it's the wheel of the year. And the pagans said that it had to be turned by some god or goddess. 
So they said the queen of heaven, queen of heaven was turning this, and this is the same thing over here as this over here, and it's the same thing as this right here. So what they did, they would worship this wheel of the year. If you celebrate Christmas, you're worshiping the swastika is what you're worshiping. This right here is Samhain or Halloween. Samhain is the old ancient pagan name. This down here is Yule. This was around long before Jesus was born. That's why when you get down here to Yule or the winter, you've got December the 21st, and they thought the sun was burning out, and they said they had to light these bale fires, bale fires, in order to get back to the spring and help the, help the earth stay warm. You say, why are you putting that on the board again? I put it on the board about four times. Well, this swastika or this wheel of the year, I've had people tune in and look and say, aha, a bunch of Nazis. No, <laughs> no, you don't understand. If you're celebrating Christmas, you're giving credence to this swastika. You're giving credence to this wheel of the year. And Israel was indicted in the 44th chapter of Jeremiah and the 7th chapter of Jeremiah for worshiping the queen of heaven. And everyone that is familiar with Roman Catholicism knows that the Mary of Roman Catholicism is the queen of heaven. Now, why am I putting this on the board? I was in the doctor's office about six months ago, one of my doctor's office, and I just picked up this little kid's book. I always, you'll find things that are really interesting, planet earth. And I flipped it open to the front page and I thought, oh goodness, uh, this thing of the winter solstice is, let me use a big word like one of these guys on radio, it's ubiquitous. That means it's everywhere. It's everywhere. And I'm reading along here and it says in the introduction, earth is the only planet in the universe to harbor life. It is surrounded by a protective blanket of air the atmosphere that allows us to breathe and prevents the earth from coming too hot. The earth's orbit around the sun and its tilted axis. This is a children's book. Picked it up at the dollar store. That's what the lady said at the office. I said, can I take that book with me? She said, yes. And its tilted axis are responsible for its weather, its climate, and its seasons. And that's why they were worshiping the sun because they thought the sun was burning out. And actually, they thought the sun was moving, and it was the earth was moving, so they thought the sun's moving away, so we've got to keep this festival in December, and that was the festival that Constantine brought in the church. It's a Roman Catholic festival, and renamed it Christ Mass. And he goes on to say, the planets often dramatic landforms, its mountains, valleys, and caves, were formed over millions of years, and it goes on to this. But I just thought that was interesting. It's talking about the earth turning on its axis. Then my daughter-in-law, Karen, was at the library and ran across this book. It's everywhere. This is called The Shortest Day Celebrating the Winter Solstice. And, and this is for children like eight and nine years old. Now just listen to a few things here. And this woman is a, a world famous, I looked her up on the internet, She's a world-famous children's writer. And it, and it goes into this, and in, in the introduction area, it says, Winter begins on the shortest day of the year, on or about December the 21st. That's the winter solstice, the longest days of the year. On short winter days, children walking home from school drag long shadows behind them. On long winter nights, families eat dinner while it's dark outside. We all know that. They thought the sun was burning out among the pagans. They knew nothing about astronomy. Long ago, people grew afraid when each day had fewer hours of sunshine than the day before. And she keeps it kind of nice and simple and quiet without any alarm involved in it. She just simply says, uh, long ago, people grew afraid. She doesn't put a big neon sign by saying that. She said they grew afraid. Well, certainly we know they did. They worshiped the sun. Because they, and this is the sun worship that Israel was involved in, and God destroyed Israel for 2,600 years for being involved in this. It's not as innocent as she paints it, but let me, let me just read some things. Over time, they realized that one day each year, the sun seemed to stop moving away and then started moving back toward them. They celebrated this day by exchanging presents, decorating their houses with evergreens. 
I've, you've heard me say that. In the Scandinavian countries, they said the evergreens were magical trees. So they would take the greenery and they would take the holly and they would put it around. This is long before Christ in Scandinavia. Scandinavia is Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Finland, north of Europe. And they would decorate, since it was so cold there, they would decorate their houses and their pagan temples with holly and greenery. And they would gather around. They, If you've ever seen anybody with a with a wreath on their head and had candles on it, that's what they, that's how they would uh, uh, decorate themselves up. And they had what they called a wassailing bowl songs. They had wassailing bowl songs, and the, one of the most popular one, one of the most popular ones was deck the halls with boughs of holly, fa la 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 la. What does that have to do with Jesus? Zero. Then today people still celebrate winter solstice. And the amazing thing, she doesn't mean, she doesn't mention Jesus, God, none of that in here. Christmas, doesn't even mention that. Isn't that amazing? She doesn't try to sell you on Christmas. She's telling you about the winter solstice. He says, she says, today people still celebrate the winter solstice, not because they worry that the sun disappears, but because they know the days will get longer again. And they celebrate because it's a new beginning. Now, then it'll show you nice little pretty pictures of the squirrels and the leaves falling. In the late summer, the northern part of the world, squirrels hide nuts, foxes grow thick fur coats, and flocks of birds fly to warmer places. And they serve the sun because of this. And the sun rises late each morning and sets early each evening. We use that to preach on, don't we? Each day it appears lower in the southern sky. As the sun gets lower and lower, the north gets less and less sunlight. The air grows colder. And then goes into the chickadees, fluff their feathers to keep warm woodchucks hibernating their burrows. And we know all about that. And then they go on, on short winter days, children bundled in warm clothes and walk through frosty white, a frosty white world dragging long shadows behind them. On long winter nights, families eat dinner while it's dark outside. But in the pagan world, they said the sun was leaving the earth and burning out. Then you get on over here in the north on December the 21st. The sun reaches its lowest point on the horizon. This whole book is about the winter solstice, which is what this is about, which is what this is about, and which this is about. I wanted to put it up here. The shortest day called the winter solstice is the beginning of winter. In some places, winter means cold nose nipping weather. They make it sound so innocent for children. And then they get in here. Long ago, people didn't understand how the earth tilts and moves around the sun. They didn't understand why each day had less sunshine than the day before. Some believe that evil spirits made the sun go away. Well, we know about that, don't we? It's amazing. This is for children. It's everywhere. People feared that the sun wouldn't shine on them anymore, making their world cold and dreary dark. That's why they worshiped the sun. They didn't think the sun would shine anymore. They needed the sun's warmth and light. So did their plants, which they needed for food. They held ceremonies that lasted for weeks. Well, how about Saturnalia? To persuade their gods to bring the sun back. This is a children's book. We know what that's about, don't we? That's about the Christ Mass. And then they got all the pagans out here and the barbarians. Over the years, people noticed that after short days, the days got gradually longer. Joyous people bathed in the sun's warmth and light. About 5,000 years ago, people studied the sky and noticed that the day after day, we're talking about long before Jesus, they set different places on the western horizon, they discovered that when the sun set farther south, that was the shortest day. They figured that out 5,000 years ago, long before Jesus. You understand what I'm saying this? So you'll see it's everywhere we turn. On the day when the sun reached the southernmost point on the horizon, the astronomers carried out their plan, and it goes all through this. Days gradually got longer, and it amazes me. Let me... Let me turn on over here. I can't read all of it. It doesn't mention anything about Christmas, December the 25th, or Jesus. It's got the Incas here, uh, what they did. 
in Peru, marked the shortest day with a festival in honor of the sun. That's the Saturnalia, or that's Christ's Mass, Christmas. And this is an interesting page here, one of the most interesting. Today, people will celebrate at the beginning of winter by decorating their houses, lighting the darkness, gathering together, and exchanging gifts. No Jesus in it. No Christmas in it. She doesn't mention Christmas or Jesus. It's just winter solstice. So I started, went online, and I wanted to find out. I couldn't find out what she was. I was wondering if she was a witch or she's an atheist. She doesn't mention Christmas. They no longer worry that the sun will disappear forever. People know that days get colder when they're part of the earth, tilts away from the sun. They know that the days get shorter when the sun appears lower in the sky. And then it starts talking about the sun getting brighter. That's an amazing book. That'll tell you the truth about Christmas if you know how to read between the lines. Now, it's everywhere. I've got a book I've had for years. Christmas, a pictorial pilgrimage. This is the kind of book you lay down on your coffee table so people can sit there while they're bored and go, oh, this is interesting. Oh, I read through this book and while I'm sitting waiting for the doctor or while I'm waiting for my friends to come out of their, wherever they are. And this is about Christmas. Christmas. And on the first page here, the history of the Christmas feast, there was a time, however, when Christmas was not celebrated in Bethlehem or anywhere else in Christendom or among Christianity. The first Christians were interested only in the death and resurrection of Christ. The primary Christian feasts were, and I will disagree with Easter, they mean the resurrection and the day of the Lord, which is the first day of the week. For this reason, the, well, let me go on to something further than that. Let me, now, over here, I just kind of marked them here. About the middle of the fourth century, another feast came suddenly into being the celebration of Christ's birth on December the 25th. This was in the middle of the fourth century. Constantine brought it in the church in 325 A.D., didn't hit a calendar, till 354 A.D., and they started celebrating it in 334 A.D. This was over 300 years after the death of Christ. Forget his birth. They didn't start celebrating Christmas till the middle of the 4th century, and that's what it says in this Christmas book that you're supposed to sit around and read and look at like, oh, that's interesting, and you have no conviction about it. Therefore, Christianity took a right practice hitherto only by pagans. This out of a Christmas book. How was the date of December the 25th decided upon? This question worries historians to this day. Christmas was first mentioned in Rome about 336 during the reign of the first Christian emperor, Constantine. First of all, he wasn't a Christian who ruled that the Sunday be declared a state holiday and that Christmas be celebrated on December the 25th. Incidentally, this date appeared most expedient because it coincided with the high feast of the sun cult, which had long been practiced in Ro Roman Empire as part of a popular Mithra religion. When you look up Mithra in McClinic and Strong, it will tell you Mithra's birthday was the most famous day in Rome. It was December the 25th. That's because the sun came down to the winter solstice, and this is where Christmas comes from, on December the 21st, and they said we have to have the birth of the unconquerable sun, so they set a birthday for the unconquerable sun, December the 25th, so the sun can begin to wax greater again, and they can get back to the, thought, the spring equinox, equal night, and then they can have crops in the spring. And that's Christ Mass. Gosh, I could read all of this. In this matter, Constantine used the unifying power of Christianity to buttress his empire without resorting to complete abolition of paganism. He wanted to get the pagans into the church, and he says, I cannot stand up against the, I can't stand against the Visigoths and the Goths and the Vandals and the Huns and the Celts and the Gauls. They're going to run over the empire, so I'll bring their gods into the church 
and I'll bring those in, and I'll bring the Saturnalia, the Feast of Saturn, I'll amalgamate it together, and I'll have religion amalgamated with it. And what you have is a mixed religion. That's what Christmas is about. When you have strychnine, and you have uh, orange juice, what do you have? A 100% poison, don't you? When you mix truth with a lie, it's 100% lie. Now, let me give you something else. I got a book. I just got the copies of it. Anniversaries and Holidays by Mary Hazeltine. I'm not... These are people that have no axe to grind with Christmas. And she has a book. It's similar to this one. You set it around for people to read for their interest. And it talks about anniversaries and holidays and it tells you in here you've got uh, hold on here it's got date of Christmas she'll tell you all about it date of I'm showing you things these people are not preaching against Christmas they're just simply giving you something to lay out on your coffee table so people can read while they're instead of being bored date of Christmas Rise of Christmas customs, Christmas gifts, they all come out of paganism. They'll all tell you that. And these people are not putting down Christmas. They're just saying, here's some nice, colorful paganism behind Christmas. And maybe you'd like to know this so you can uh, put it in your, in your Christmas uh, celebrations. Date of Christmas. The exact date of Christ's birth is unknown. It was not until the third century that the anniversary was observed to any appreciable content. There was no general agreement regarding the date of which it should be celebrated. And then it goes into, and he goes into the selection of December the 25th was due largely to the fact that it coincided with that of the greatest of pagan festivals which celebrated the winter solstice. They say which occurs December the 22nd, but it occurs December the 21st. So they made a couple of mistakes here. The birthday of the new sun about to return once more toward the earth. And you can read all of these, and none of these are trying to put Christmas down. They're just telling you it comes out of paganism. Roman Catholicism comes out of paganism. Sidney used to, Sid and Martin used to be our song leader. Sid was a, had a master's degree, don't sound like it, talks like this all the time. Talks like, doesn't he? Talks out of the corner of his mouth. And he talks and he's brilliant when it comes to music. He's got a master's degree in it. I had one guy come in here. He said, man, and he was a musician. He said, man, when he starts talking about music, he loses me. So he talks about that Ipsilidian mood and talks about the ancient songs. And the, and the uh, Sidney had a songbook in his possession. Being a, he taught out here at Antioch High School. And he's taught at high schools down in Louisiana. And he had a songbook, and the title of it was International Book of Christmas Carols. He said, I had that for 25 years, and until I met you and heard you, I never looked at the introduction of it. And he said, I never saw what it had to say. And it says, Christmas and its songs, and immediately it goes into the earliest source now, this was a Christmas carol book, but this was the introduction. The earliest source of Christmas customs is probably the Sumerian civilization, which flourished over 4,000 years ago in his Christmas book. Jesus lived 2,000 years ago. And this says the earliest Christmas customs 4,000 years ago, Marduk, the chief god of Sumar, and Sumar is S-U-M-E-R, is the lower Mesopotamian valley of what we call Iraq, there between the Tigris and the Euphrates River. That's what it is. And certainly we know that's true because all, all life began in that valley because that's in all probability that's where the Garden of Eden was. It was when you look at the second chapter of Genesis and you see the great river of Egypt and it gives you the height of Kel, which is up here, the Tigris, and it says... That was the borders of Eden. And originally, that was the borders of Israel in the 15th chapter of Genesis. And it says, eastward in Eden. So you've got to be over here somewhere in the neighborhood of 
of lower Iraq or Babylon or whatever you want to call it, the land of Haran. And he goes in here, the world of Marduk's making had just rejuvenated periodically. An elaborate fe festival, Zagmuk, sounds like that candy bar, doesn't it? Was established, was established to persuade Marduk to return in the underworld and battle chaos for another cycle of seasons. As a matter of remind you, I'm reading out of a Christmas carol book. And it's talking about Zagmuk and, and Marduk, and it goes into all of these, gosh, the chief influence of Mesopotamian religion upon Greece and Egypt was through sun-worshipping cult developed in Persian prophet Mithras. Rome also served prominent place for sun worship according to the Roman calendar. December the 25th was the day when the sun reached its weakest peak and began to regain its strength. It was also the birthday of Mithra. Romans observed a special ritual on December the 25th, Solus Invictus, for the sun's replenishment or the birthday of the unconquerable sun. And that's not putting down Christmas either. This is encouraging you to sing Christmas carols. And the first Christmas carols was written by Roman Catholic priest. Silent Night was written by a Roman Catholic priest. Tell me what Silent Night has to do with Jesus. Silent Night, Holy Night. What in the world are you talking about? No daily cross there. No death to self is there. Goodness sakes alive. I've got so many things on these things. It's not just me that's saying it. The world is saying it. It's everywhere. How in the world did it end up in Rome? And what did Israel have to do with this? And why was Israel destroyed for 2,600 years? Israel was destroyed because they kept going after the same system. They went after the queen of heaven. And all of this began at Babel. Babylon was the mother of all harlots, Revelation 17 and 5. 17 and 5, Babylon mothered it all. And if Babylon gave birth to it, Babylon began in Genesis 11 and 4, and their doctrine was, let us make us a name. It was self. And the word name is the word Shem. It means instruction. We'll make up our own instruction. This they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from their imagination. Israel went after the same gods that constantly brought the church. They're the same gods because the Bible says everything that's not of God started at Babel. So all the gods of the world comes out of Babel, comes out of self and man's imagination. That's where it comes from. How did it get into, how can you prove that the gods of Israel were the gods of the Roman Catholic Church. Well, let's see here, okay? Let me erase this. I'll leave the wheel of the year up there. The swastika, that's the reason for the season, or the wheel of the year. And Israel is, God says, I'll destroy you for worshiping the queen of heaven. And they said the queen of heaven had to turn the wheel to get them from all through the winter and back around the spring so they could have crops. It was about all about what are we going to eat? That's what it was about. That's a that's, Yeah, that's alive and well today, like Mary said, isn't it? Where are we going to eat? What are we going to eat? That's what people be saying after church, won't they? Yeah. What are we going to eat? Yeah, we, me and Mary, say that. I'm tired of eating at these restaurants. What are we going to do? I don't know. But their problem was getting through those long, hard winters and getting to spring. They didn't have the supermarkets. They didn't have ways of storing food that like, like we have. It doesn't matter whether the world believes it or not. And the reason people don't want to be involved in it is because they don't like the idea that they're going to make their family angry. They're going to make their mother and father angry. They're going to make their brothers and sisters and their grandparents angry. And they're going to make their preachers angry. But when you get into truth, the Bible says in Matthew 10 and Luke 12, a man's foes will be those of his own household. They're not going to be your enemy because you're talking about singing just as I am and accepting Christ, which is not true. They're going to be your enemy because you tell them Christmas is pagan, Easter is pagan, God does not love everybody. He died for his wife, the church, and he died for no one but his church. You tell them that and they'll get angry. You tell them Easter is the resurrection of Ishtar, or it's the resurrection of her, her son, husband, a pollution, Tammuz. 
in the ancient world. Now, here's how it got to Rome. Here's Israel right here. If this is Israel, and here's what we call Lebanon right here, and here's Syria right here, Lebanon. And this is actually ancient Tyre and Sidon. Tyre and Sidon was a center of sun and tree worship. They kept this thing going in their day. That's why the, the king of Tyre is called the prince of Tyre. Prince of Tyre in Ezekiel, the 28th chapter. And he's compared with Satan. That's because sun worship was alive here, live and well. Tree worship was alive and well. Over here is whenever I draw Babylon, I put these two lines like this. I forget to explain it. That's because this is the Tigris and this is the Euphrates River. And this is, that's Iraq, what we call Iraq. That is ancient Babylon or the land of Haran. That's where Abraham came from. When, when, when Noah landed on the mountains of Ararat, which is in western Turkey, then the, his third-born son, Ham, and all of his descendants went down here into Egypt. They migrated to Egypt, Ethiopia down here, the Sudan. And then, and then uh, his eldest son, Japheth, went up here into the Caucasus Mountains, that was the Caucasians, that was very barbaric people, or the Scythians were up here between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. And then Shem, we get the word Semitic, his second-born son who received the promise of God, migrated down here into lower Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia means between the rivers or between the Tigris and Euphrates River. So they migrated down here. This is why God called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees. The Chaldees, it's believed, were mountains down in that area. And the magicians of Babylon were called the Chaldeans. Anytime you see Chaldees or Chaldeans, if you'll notice in your Strong's Concordance, if you look up a Greek word, it says Hebrew Chaldee Dictionary in the back, doesn't it? On the top of the page. The reason it says Chaldee is because Hebrew was a dialect of the Assyrian or the Chaldean language. So, Abraham is down here, and he's called out of Ur the Chaldees to come over here, and God gives him Israel. And God tells him, if you go after other gods, I'll send four judgments. I'll send the sword, the famine, the pestilence, and the beast. Well, how did all of that, and beast is Babylon, Persia, Greece, and then Rome? Well, they were a nation for 500 years under kings, First Samuel through Second Chronicles, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. They were a nation for five hundred and ten years, and they kept going after Baal. If they went after Baal, and that's another god, they went after the grove. That's the tree goddess, and Baal was a sun god. Then his birthday was December the twenty-fifth, and all the male deities, their birthdays were December the twenty-fifth because that's where the sun waned down to that point. Well, Israel, how did Israel get involved in this sun and tree worship? Well, they got involved in it. We always hear about Jezebel all our life. And Frank Elaine had an old song, If ever the devil was born without a pair of horns, it was you, Jezebel, it was you. But that's talking about a woman, uh, two-time and her husband. Uh, that's not the one we're talking about. They write songs about her. She is... She's got this stigma tied to her name. You don't name your daughter Jezebel, do you? <laughs> and if you'll notice on the end of her name, you have Jezebel. Bell is another term. Bell, B-E-L means confounder. Confounder. And they worshipped Baal. And Jezebel's father was Ethbaal up here in Tyre and Sidon. He was Ethbaal. And Ethbaal means with Baal. Now, this is how Israel got involved in this. Jezebel somehow meets, meets Ahab, who is king of northern Israel. Of course, Israel was split into two nations because 
of the apostasy of Solomon in the 11th chapter of 1 Kings. Solomon goes after 700 wives and 300 concubines, and the Bible calls them strange women. It don't mean weird women. It means they were foreign women worshiping all these idols. And the Bible says they worshiped Shemosh, Molech, Ashtaroth. He actually married Pharaoh's daughter. Can you imagine that? Why? I guess she looked good, probably. So, here's how it ends up. Here's how you can prove that Israel worshiping Bell in the Grove is the same system of Rome over here. Let me race this up here. Let me move this over a little. Let's just say this is Iraq over here. There's the Tigris, Euphrates. And Babylon is on the Euphrates River. Here's Iraq here. Here. Now, Ethbaal, according to the historians, he was a priest of Baal and Ashtaroth. The same system, or Ashtoreth would be plural, Ashtaroth be singular. He was, it was the same system that was alive and well over here in Babylon. Now, there's two men that are equated with Satan himself, and that is the prince of Tyre, because the fire worship and the tree worship is alive, and he keeps it thriving over here in Tyre and Sidon. And in Ezekiel 28, he's called the prince of Tyre, or the anointed cherub that covereth, and he was in the garden of God. So, satanic possession is not somebody walling on the floor and going, eh, ooh, ah, eh, and your head spinning around. That's not satanic possession. Satanic possession is when you're possessed with self. It's when you're possessed with the Babylonian system of let me make up my own doctrine and let me make me a name. If you do not believe the truth of the Word of God, the defined Word of God, you're going after your own doctrine, your own self. And you'll die in your sin and go to hell if you go after self. Now, how did this happen that it got over here? How did it get to Rome? Here's the you got Turkey over here, Turkey, and then you've got, then you've got, you got Greece here, and then you got, you got Rome over here, Rome. Here's the boot of Italy, and here's Rome. How, how is it that Israel? Is serving the same God. Well, first of all, it comes from Ahab marries Jezebel. He's the king of Israel, of northern Israel. He marries Jezebel. Somehow he met her. He's right here on the border of, of what we call Lebanon or Tyre and Sidon. And Mount Carmel is in northern Israel. And that's where his hangout was normally. He liked, that was where his one of his palaces was, and he'd like to be up there. And he's right close to the border. Probably some party took place, and he said, let's invite these, these strangers here from Tyre. And they come down there, and Ahab meets Jezebel, and she's real hot looking. And he says, I want to marry her. He marries her. She says, I'm going to bring my father's gods down here to Israel. Look at that in the, look at that in the 16th chapter of 1 Kings. 1 Kings 16. Now, this is how it gets into Israel. Israel's involved in this. This is why God scattered them for 2,600 years. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, speaking of Israel. And they'll be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem will be trodden down of the Gentiles until God's revenge upon Israel is fulfilled because of their apostasy going after these gods, which is the same thing as Christ's mass. Bell and Grove is Christmas. That's not a matter of opinion. That's historical fact. You think if God's going to destroy millions, he's going to destroy millions, he wants us to do it? He destroyed millions of Jews over 2,600 2, years, and the last Assyrian that God used to destroy the Jews was a man named Adolf Hitler. He was an Assyrian. He was a Caucasian just like me. And he destroyed six million of them. He was the last sword that God re lifted up to cut Israel to the ground. And God says, I'll destroy you when you go after these idol gods. 
Now, look here in the 16th chapter of 1 Kings. Ahab and Jezebel, the most evil thing they did, yes, they murdered people. Yes, they murdered Naboth. Jezebel did. She was a sleaze and a swine. Yes, they had a daughter named Athaliah who came down and corrupted southern Judah with his same system. Athaliah, when she comes down here, she marries Jehoshaphat, but Jehoshaphat is running around with Ahab, and Jehoshaphat is a righteous man. Ahab's an evil man. This is what happens when you allow your kids to wrong with the wrong people. Wrong people. They'll marry them. So she marries down into southern Judah, and Athaliah brings her gods when she marries Jehoshaphat. It all came into Israel right here, 16th chapter. Look here in verse 29. In the 30th and 8th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, the son of Omri, began to reign over Israel. When Asa was ruling, Ahab starts ruling in northern Israel. He's ruling already, and Ahab starts to rule down in northern Israel, and Asa was, was ruling in southern Judah. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria, which is another term for northern Israel, 20 and 2 years. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. And it came to pass as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. What a name, Nebat. Name your kid Nebat. What was the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, in the 12th chapter of 1 Kings, when Rehoboam starts to attack Jeroboam for caring for the 10 northern tribes pulling away, and Rehoboam tells Israel, they say, be easier on us, your father chastised us with whips, and they were talking about heavy taxes, he said, I'll chastise you with scorpions, and then the ten northern tribes went to Jeroboam, the commanding general of southern Judah, and said, take us and rule us. And Jeroboam came their God, became their king. And then Rehoboam starts to attack northern Israel. And, and the prophet Shimei comes to Rehoboam and says, no, do not do this. This is of God. God's splitting the nation because of Solomon, your father's pagan god worship." So Rehoboam backs off, and Jeroboam says, if I don't do something, I'm going to end up losing the ten tribes. They're going to go back to Rehoboam. Well, Jeroboam sets up golden calf worship in northern Israel and says, behold the gods that bring you out of, brought you out of Egypt. He didn't actually say we believe in golden calves. He just simply reduced Jehovah God to a golden calf. So the sin, anytime you see Jeroboam's sin, it's talking about that golden calf worship. Now, let's read. And it came to pass, verse 31, as if it had been a light thing for Ahab to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Mebat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Zidonians, or the king of Tyre, the prince of Tyre, Sidon, or Zidon, and Tyre were equated as the same thing, even though they were two different cities. And went and served Baal and worshipped him. But that's not the worst of it. They'd worshipped Baal in Israel before, or this sun god whose birthday was December the 25th. And he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in northern Israel or in Samaria. He's building temples for Baal, and Baal is going to become the national god, and Grove is going to be the national goddess of northern Israel. And Ahab made a grove, an Asherah, an upright goddess, a tree goddess. That's the Christmas tree right there. Asherah, upright. That's what the Bible says in Jeremiah 10. They were upright as a, as a tree, 
and they can't move and they can't speak and they take a tree out of the forest and they cut it down, they deck it with silver and gold that it moved not. That's the Christmas tree. People try to, they try to deny that's the, the Christmas tree. I heard Jack Van Wimpy and his plastic woman there trying to deny this one night. I don't like a man that lies about God. And I don't like him lying about God. And Ahab made a grove and Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger. It angered God when he brought Baal and Grove, our tree goddess and sun god worship into Israel on December the 25th. Israel is starting to celebrate Christmas long before it's called Christmas under another name. To anger and Ahab made a grove, and Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. So in the 17th chapter, he sends Elijah a Tishbite and says, there'll be no rain in Israel for three and a half years. How's that for famine? Three and a half years, not a drop will hit the ground. God says, I'll make, the, I'll make your heavens brass and I'll make the ground iron. What do you think we're having in the world today? We're having famine. We're having economy problems, aren't we? So this is how it began to come into Israel as a national religion. And all the Levites, which are the priests of God, said, we ain't going to have this. And they ran south. They took out of there because they've got these Baal, Baal priests up there in northern Israel now. Anybody who wants to stay and be a Baal priest, you can I've had people say, why was God angry at Israel? He was furious with them for celebrating Christmas 4,000 years ago under another name. Now, how did it get over here? Over here to Rome. Well, when Cyrus comes over from what we call Iran, but back then it was called Persia, the Persian Empire overthrows the Babylonian system. Cyrus comes over, diverts the Euphrates River out here into the Arabian Desert, because Babylon said, we can't be conquered. We got this great big city that straddles the river, and nobody can conquer us. We got walls that are nearly 400 feet high, and we got a moat that's about nearly 400 feet deep, and the river runs around us and through us. That's a terrible place to build your houses up on the sand. And that's what they did. So Cyrus comes over, says, I know how I can conquer you. He diverts the river out here. The riverbed dries up. He marches down the riverbed, walks in there in the fifth chapter of Daniel and in the, and in the 44th, chapter of, 44th and 45th chapter of Isaiah and in the 50th and 51st chapter of Jeremiah. All those are the same event. Daniel 5. That's where Belshazzar's parting with the vessels of the house of the Lord. Isaiah 40. Excuse me. Isaiah 44. Well, let me get, excuse me. Let me put a couple others in here. Isaiah. Isaiah 13 and 14. Isaiah 44 and 45. And Jeremiah 50 and 51. All of these are just different pictures of the same event. They're different views. This is Belshazzar uh, in the parting with the vessels of the house of the Lord when Cyrus marches down and catches him and says, you're under arrest, and he kills him that night. And then 13 is about Persia attacking uh, Babylon. 14 is, is a proverb against the king of Babylon, and the king of Babylon was Belshazzar. It's against king of Babylon. And when, it, when the Bible says, well, look at that. Look, look over here at, uh, Isaiah, at uh, Isaiah 14. This is the only other place that a man, besides the 28th chapter of Ezekiel, when the Bible speaks of the prince of Tyre that was in the garden with God, and he was the anointed cherub that covered, speaking with Satan, it's speaking in the sense that 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 Ethbaal was involved in the tree and sun worship or Christ's mass. God equates the two evil men equated with Satan as the men who kept the fire worship or the tree worship or Christmas going in the ancient world under another name. That's how evil God looked at Christ's mass. 
So let's look here in Isaiah. I want to show you what this is talking about. This is not talking about Satan. It's only talking about Satan in the sense that self is involved in a man. All right. Isaiah 14. Two places that a man is equated with Satan. Ezekiel 28, the anointed cherub, and here in Isaiah 14. But notice what it's talking about. It speaks about, now, why was Israel carried away? They were involved in Baal and Grove and Shemash and Molech and Ashtaroth worship. All these were fine tree goddesses. Then here in the 13th chapter, the Bible speaks of, well, I won't read all of it, talking about the bows. Well, let me look at verse 17 of chapter 13. And I will stir up the Medes against Babylon. The Mede and the Persian Empire was a dual empire which shall not regard silver as for gold, they will not delight in it. You cannot give them tribute and pay them off, Babylon. You're going to be destroyed. They'll take what they want when they kill all of you. Their bows shall dash the young men to pieces. They shall not have no pity on the fruit of the womb. Their eyes shall not spare children. And they slaughtered the children because it was time for them to die. And that's what happened the other day. Up in Connecticut, it was their time to die. That everything is of God, including that situation. Jim, are you cruel and hard to avoid that? No. If it wasn't their time to die, then Satan's getting by with something that God didn't want to happen, and that's not true. In Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees' excellency shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. Babylon's coming down, God says. And then in the 14th chapter, it's talking about Babylon's king. In fact, it says, verse 4, Thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon, and that is Belshazzar. It goes on down here how the oppressor ceased, the gold city ceased, the golden city ceased, that's Babylon. And he goes on down. He talks about, Yea, the fir trees rejoice at thee, and the cedars of Lebanon saying, since thou art laid down, king of Babylon, Belshazzar, no feller, no one to fell trees is come up against us. No tree worship here in Babylon once the Persians take over. Well, they had their gods, but here's what they did. Cyrus drove this system of the Chaldeans out, and it found its home in Pergamos. That's one of the, that's, and their God was Osculopius. Their chief God was, I think that's the way you spell it, Osculopius. That was the serpent God, and that's the first time we see behind the heads, behind the serpent, I'll just kind of like a, they saw for the first time the sunburst or the sun god, or what we'd call the halo, the sun god behind the heads of Osculopius in Pergamos. Now, we're, taught, we're moving towards Rome. This is how it got into Roman Catholicism. Now, let's look at verse 12. It's talking about the fall of the king of Babylon. Lucifer is not Satan. Lucifer is Belshazzar. This is a proverb against the king of Babylon, isn't it? In verse 4, and he goes on down. Let's read down to it. No feller will fell us anymore. Hell from beneath is moved for thee, for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth, and hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. All they shall speak and say unto thee, Art thou also become weak as we? Art thou become like unto us? Thy pomp, O king of Babylon, Belshazzar, is brought down to the grave. And the noise of thy vials, the worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee, because you're going to be eaten up in your grave. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, O shining one? Hyel, H-E-Y-L-E-L. 
How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? That is Belshazzar. Why is he equated with Satan himself? Because he's keeping, there's two centers of, of sun and tree worship in the world, Babylon and Tyre and Sidon, and Ethbel was a priest of the Babylonian system, and he was a priest of the female grove system and the Baal worship, and it all was founded here in Babylon. Now, how does it move up to Rome? How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? This word, Lucifer, Hylio, means it has a sense of brightness or shining. And it comes from the word halal. It's a derivative of the word halal, and we say halal. Jah, or hallelujah, hallelujah, Jah is short for Jehovah, we say the shining or the brightness belongs to Jah or Jehovah, that's short for Jehovah, the brightness belongs to no man, that's like reverend belongs to no man in the 111th Psalm, God said reverend is my name, Reverend is the word Yahweh means to fear. Unless you fear a man, don't call him Reverend. What can we call you? Well, you can call me Jim. It's a good thing to call me. You can call me Pastor if you want to do that, or Shepherd, but don't call me Reverend. You can call me Jim. Don't call me Johnson. <laughs> I wish I could say that like he said it. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. Isn't that what everybody says? I'm going to heaven one day. I'm a, I'm a tree worshiper, and I like Christmas, and I like free will. But I'm going to heaven. I'm going to ascend into heaven and be like the Most High. That's what Belshazzar said. This certainly is Satan inhabiting Belshazzar because he is the two system that kept the fire worship going was the prince of Tyre over here and Babylon. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. That's not Satan. That is Belshazzar. But he is being possessed by Satan, not in the sense he's wallowing on the floor and spitting green pea soup going, eh, uh, ah, eh. That's not satanic possession. Satanic possession is when you're involved in let me make up my own name, my own doctrine. That's when you're involved in satanic possession when you say, I don't think God minds this. You think he doesn't mind Christmas? You think he's going to let you have a Christmas tree in heaven? You're really bad mistaken. Can I have a God in heaven, Lord, besides you? I will also sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. You're going to hell, Belshazzar. Now, how did that get into the church? Well, when Cyrus comes in, the Chaldeans moved to Pergamum. Let's go to Revelation. The, this is one of the churches of Asia. Revelation, the second chapter. The Pergamum Empire was an empire that had its seat right there in Pergamus on the western end of Turkey over here. This was called Asia Minor. And the seven churches of Asia were right in here, right here on the western end of Turkey. Seven churches of Asia is right here. There's Greece here, and then you get over to Rome. How did it get to Rome? Into Roman Catholicism. If you'll notice, we've traced it. It came down into southern Judah when Athaliah married Jehoram. And she brought her gods down here it had penetrated northern Israel through Ahab and Jezebel, and it was originally came from Babylon, 
It was driven up here to Pergamos. That's why it speaks this way. Let's read. There's seven churches of Asia that have a glitch in them. They have a problem. They've got sin in them that needs to be corrected. <coughs> now, we're talking about Pergamos. This is the third church. And to the angel, verse 12, to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges coming out of his mouth in chapter 1 and verse 16. And in chapter 19 when he comes back with a sword coming out of his mouth and that's the word of God coming out of his mouth and that's what he's going to destroy with. I know thy works where thou dwellest even where Satan's seat is. The throne they actually had a throne or a chair, a chair that they used for the kings of the Chaldeans to sit on, and they moved the seat over here. They moved the chair over there. Where Satan's, even where Satan's seat is, thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied the faith, even in those days where an Antipas was my faithful martyr, and we don't know who Antipas was. He was a man who died for the cause of Christ, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. John is emphasizing through the Holy Spirit here that this was the very seat of Satan or the place where this had moved from Babylon. When you study the history, it'll tell you that it moved up here to Pergamos. Now the king of Pergamos, there was a king named Attalus the third. Over here in Babylon, these Chaldeans, these Chaldeans, they had mastered magicianry. They had mastered sleight of hand. And they were considered the earliest magicians. And they, they started passing magicianry off as though it was a divine ability from the gods to do these things. And they were trying to make people think their magic tricks was because they were, had a gift from the gods. They weren't telling anyone it was magic. The word magic, magic comes from the word M-A-G. I, I, or M-A-G-O-S, Magos. When the Magi came from over in Babylon over to see Jesus, you had different Magi. You had, you had Shem's descendants, and you had the descendants of the pagans over there. The pagans were the evil Magi, and they all studied the stars, and when they saw the star, and they were in the east, and they come over here to see Jesus in Jerusalem. It's going to take them months to get there, going by horse or by camel or however they got there, by walking. They didn't come over there while he was still a babe in a manger. We've said in Matthew, the second chapter, he was a young child in a house when the wise men got there. And there were not three wise men. There were three gifts. We don't know how many wise men there were. We don't know if they rode camels or not. It just shows you how messed up on the simple things our society is. When Herod gave an edict to kill all the children from two years old and under, and the wise men had come to the house where the young child was, they didn't come to the manger. Only the angels, only the shepherds got to the manger in Luke, the second chapter. The wise men never came to a manger, much, much less Santa Claus coming to a manger. Gosh, how ridiculous. So, they're over here. The, they had mastered this magicianry, and we've already talked about they mastered ventriloquism. And they would speak into they would speak into bottles, which were goat skins. They would cut a goat skin out, dry it, they would plug in one end of it, put a stopper in the other end, and they would they would peep and mutter and speak, and that's kind of a tone, like they were talking like they're talking to the dead and that was necromancy and they were saying they were speaking to the dead. Well, that's all phony. They had mastered that too. 
So they mastered all this magician ventriloquism, and they were telling people they were talking to the dead and that they were performing these sleight of hand, and they said it was a divine gift from the gods. That moved up to Pergamos, and the Romans loved this. They were called Etruscans up in Pergamos, but they were the Chaldeans of Babylon. It's like evolving anything else. The name evolved. And these Etruscans were the magicians of Pergamos. When Italus III died, since Rome loved this magicianry and all this ventriloquism, they, King Italus III left all of his system to Rome. And that was brought into the temple of Mithra, And the Vestal Virgins, Vestal Virgins, anybody that named their daughter Vestal? <laughs> like Vestal Goodman. Like Vestal Goodman, yeah. She, she was a goofy woman. But anybody that named their daughter Vestal, something's wrong with you. The Vestal Virgins had to keep the fires going in the temple of Mithra, and these were eternal flames, eternal flames, well, over here in Israel, south of Jerusalem, southeast of Jerusalem was the valley of Tophet, and they, they worshipped Molech. Israel worshipped Molech, the sun god, the sun god of the Jordanians or the Ammonites, northern Jordan. Jordan was the land of Ammon. That's just east of Israel. And Moab... Moab, they worship Shemosh, and all that had crept in in Israel. And Shemesh is, the, is, a, is a Moab word. Is a Moab word. Excuse me. Shemesh is a Hebrew word. That means sun. Well, they were worshiping Shemosh. They were worshiping Molech from Ammon. And God says, I'm going to judge all of these nations that have polluted Israel. And I'm going to judge Israel for being polluted with all of this. And all, every God of the Old Testament has to do with Christ Mass. Every God. All this comes out of Babylon herself. So they bring this into, into Rome. That boot's awful ugly looking. But they bring it to Rome. They bring all this system and you can trace. And then Rome brings it. It comes to America when the Puritans come to America. Here we are in America. They come to America. When they were in England, or when they were in Europe, they were called Albigenses. The Albigens family. And the Waldens family. And the Huguenots in France. These families and more, these were families that had multiplied and become a tremendous over 100 plus years that become extremely large families. They believe in predestination. They believe God did not love everybody. They believed in the things that we believe here. They knew Christmas was pagan. And these people were persecuted while they were in Europe by the Roman Catholic Church, Roman Catholic Church, and they were slaughtered during the Inquisition During the Inquisition, it was called the Spanish Inquisition at first, but it spread all over the world. I've said before, when you see the old movie, The Conqueror Worm, and the witch general, the witch-finding general, uh, what's his name, played the Vincent Price, played the witch-finding general. They're going around killing people who they say are heretics. That was actually a picture of the Roman Catholic Church killing the Christians, and they called them heretics and witches. The witch hunt in Salem, Massachusetts, in the New England area, was about killing, mostly about killing Puritans and calling them witches. So when they came to America, they said, we will purify this nation of all papal influences, Roman Catholic. Papal means Roman Catholic. And they said, we'll purify this nation and we will, we will outlaw Christmas. And they outlawed Christmas in the mid-1600s. It was against the law to celebrate Christmas. You could be fined 
and may, maybe spend a few days in jail if you were caught celebrating Christmas. The Unitarians and the Universalists, they got the law repealed, but none of the Protestants would have anything to do with it till nearly 1900. America's only been celebrating Christmas for about 120, 25 years. That's it. You don't see George Washington in pictures around a Christmas tree. They didn't do it then. You don't see Abe Lincoln around a Christmas tree. They didn't do it then. You don't find paintings of Christmas trees in early America. Have you ever noticed that? It's because they didn't do it. It was against the law. They knew that it was Roman Catholic papal worship. And whenever, with all of this fairness doctrine going on in America, they think you're crazy if you bring this out. It shows you how apostate and far from God that America is. Well... Then you end up with John Kennedy as president, John Kennedy, and then when he dies, he's buried in Arlington National Cemetery, and they have an eternal flame. He was a Roman Catholic, eternal flame there, and you can trace that back to before the Puritans, trace it back to Rome, Roman Catholic Church, trace it back to Pergamos, trace it back to Babylon, trace it over to Tyre, trace it down into northern Israel and southern Judah. It's the same system of Baal in the grove, Christmas, the eternal fire. What do you think all these lights are about? They lit candles to light up the darkness. All these Christmas lights are about, they're about the fire of the ancient world. They lit up the darkness they and they would party and they'd say everything's getting dark so we got a party and they were slaughtering the they were slaughtering their hogs and slaughtering their their beef at that time of the year and trying to pack it away and the sun's moving away and we got a party as we're going into this darkness and it was a way of entertaining themselves i hope you can see how this thing ended up magic means science of the magi i don't know if i said that that's what the word means. Science of the Magi or science of the Magos. Magi was plural. Magos was singular. And those were the Magi. That, those were the righteous Magi that came to see Jesus. The word wise man means it's the word Magi or Magos. Now, can you see this? And it was all about this right here. So here's what happens. Israel became involved in this. Let me erase this. I hope you can get a hold of this. And I have spent a lifetime studying this stuff. And let me tell you, Christmas is as healing as it can be. I mean, what's good about it? The Bible says that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination to God. Does Israel like Christmas? Does the world like Christmas? The harlot likes it. The prostitute likes it. The gangster, Al Capone, liked it. Uh, Bugsy Siegel liked it. Uh, Dutch Schultz liked it. Uh, the serial killers like it. Everybody likes Christmas. And all the world is out here getting drunk. I keep saying it's like, yes, but we don't do it that way. We get with a bunch of drunks in the world, and we don't keep it the way they do. I'm standing right here in the middle of a world full of drunken drivers and drunken boozer, boozers and all of this. And, and But we're not going to do it. We're going to stand right in the middle of them. I keep saying it's like having a hookers convention down here at the down here at the Hyatt and say they're all hookers on that fourth floor. Well, we're going to get us a room up there on the fourth floor, but we're not going to take any hookers. But we're going to go down there and look at the same crowd that they look at and watch the band down there while they're picking up their johns. And we're going to sit at a table down there. We're going to see the band. They're going to pick up johns. Their tables will be all around ours. But we ain't going to pick up no Johns. We're going to look at the band, and we're going to watch everybody drink and get drunk. But we're not going to do it. You know what Christmas is? It's renaming. It's renaming the Feast of Saturn. You can decorate a pig up all you want. Yep. <laughs> you can put a ribbon around it. You can put Eternity, my favorite cologne, on it. And when you get through with it and bathe it and clean it up and put a nice cologne on it and you can turn it outside and it will go straight to the mud hole, first mud hole it can find, won't it? Yep. Christmas under Christmas under any other name 
It's still paganism. No matter whether people like that or not, in everything in the Old Testament, the reason God destroyed Israel is over this very thing. For 2,600 years, just because you rename something, I keep saying this. If you're behind on your house during the recession and they're about to foreclose on your house, the way you get out of it, you go up to the corner, up there at the corner of Maple and Irvin, where I live, and you just pull that sign up and put, uh, put Fred Street and Johnson Street and say, I live on Fred Street. You can't repossess my house. I don't live on that street. You think changing the sign ain't going to keep them from doing that? You can't go out and rob a bank and drive home real fast. And Dwayne drives home to his boat, runs in the house, and he, and he puts on his tutu, his little, his little, his little uh, ballerina uniform, and he does start doing some pirouettes and say, I'm not a bank robber. I'm a ballet dancer. Do you think that's going to keep him from being a bank robber? Because you renamed something? Renaming the Feast of Saturn, Christ's Mass, and that was done by a Roman Catholic. Pope Julius I gave Christ's Mass its pagan name and set December the 25th. Are you going to follow Roman Catholics who killed 60 million Christians and Jews during the Inquisition? Kill these righteous, godly people? I'm not. I, I don't care if the whole world votes to do it. Yeah, but everybody else is doing it. Well, if little Johnny jumps off the cliff, are you going to jump off the cliff? That's what the mama used to say. <laughs> Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. Now in the 23rd chapter of Exodus. It don't matter how many people do it. You know why people do it? They don't want to be embarrassed and they don't know enough about the truth to give any answers to it. I just don't know enough about it. I can't stand up for what's right. Yes, you can. You need to learn. I've got five or six tracks over here on Christmas. If you'll take each one of those tracks, I've got so many facts in those tracks, I think we're out of some of them. We get the ones that's over there, and if you'll read those things and over the next year, get real founded in those facts. I've got dates and everything else on those tracks that I've written. They're on our website. Those are tracks I wrote years ago about Christmas. You can get everything you need to know about Christmas, read those five or six tracks, and you'll be loaded like Billy the Kid to shoot everybody down. You'll be able to get out there in public. What's on those tracks? Those tracks have got more information on one track. You learn what's on one of them, and you'll be able to go out there. Teach it to your kids. Read the tracks to them. I hate, I hate, I hate, 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 hate Christmas. It displeases God. Now, I've suspected it was wrong since I was a little kid. I suspected it was Roman Catholicism when I was 12 years old. Now, how did Israel get involved in this? It is Baal and Grove. It is the same system that Constantine brought in the church trying to appease the pagans. He's trying to make them happy. I'll erase the swastika. Maybe it's been up there long enough for people to say, Maybe he don't believe in that after. The point is, I don't believe in that. If you're involved in Christmas, which is Yule, and you're involved in Ishtar up here, and they're wanting to get through the winter, that's the same thing I read out of these books. The point is, I don't believe in this, and if you think that was something Adolf Hitler invented, you're wrong. It is the Big Dipper. The Big Dipper is the reason for the season. The wheel of the years, and you know where we get the wreath? from this in fact in the sun wheel the sun wheel they it's just a variation of this and they get the they get the sun wheel that's where they get it and then you have various forms of it you have the Maltese cross like so that is a form of it and the Maltese cross is you see that behind the heads of the saints that's called the nimbus it's called the halo without the Maltese cross in it. And the halo is the sun god. So every time you see pictures of people, Dwayne brought me a picture here and it's got some, some character here with the sun god behind his head trying to sell him as a saint. 
You don't put the Son of God behind the heads of the saints. It's, and it's, it's everywhere, isn't it? So how did all of this come about in Israel? Everything in the Old Testament, everything, is the same system that's been brought in the church and renamed Christ Mass. And if you think that some scholar or theologian can come up here and debate with me on this, there's no such thing as debating this. It's like saying, George Washington was not the father of our country. <laughs> stupid. To say Christmas isn't pagan, you're stupid. Stupid is the word ba'ar. It means dull of hearing. It means you won't learn. You can't learn. Well, why doesn't everybody else know this? A lot of them do know it. Did you know that? A lot of preachers know it, and they will not deal with it. Flat, will not deal with it. Ask people, do you know Christmas is pagan? Half the people you run across say, well, I know it, but we like it. And we're going to give gifts and do it in the name of Jesus. Jesus doesn't want his name on something that he destroyed Israel for. Therefore shall you keep my ordinance that you commit not any one of these abominable customs. I don't even want you knowing how they serve their gods, much less doing it as a custom in the name of Jesus. Does he? No, sir. He says in Deuteronomy 4 and Deuteronomy 12, you will not diminish, nor you will not add to my word. And I love a verse over here in, in Proverbs. Look at Proverbs 30. Proverbs 30. Proverbs 30. How much time do I have, Mike? Huh? That's all? Goodness. This thing got away from me today. Proverbs 30. Verse 5, every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that trust in him. Add not thou unto his words. The word add is the word yasaf, Y-A-C-A-P-H. Add not to his words. It means to, it means to, to add. Add to it. Don't add anything to the word of God. Lest he reprove thee and thou be found a liar. Is Christmas adding to the word of God? Yes, sir, it is. Christmas is Christ mass. It bothered me at 12 years old when I saw the Pope on TV. I said, is this Christ mass? And it was on Christmas Eve. And I said, isn't St. Nicholas a Roman Catholic something? I found out later on he is a Roman Catholic bishop of the fourth century. And oh, yes, by the way, let me go ahead and tell you. When Israel served these gods, they served Baal. The priests of Baal, priests of Baal wore tall white pointed hats and white robes or white sheets. And on Lady Day in the ancient world, they worshipped a flaming cross. The clan and the priests of Baal come out of the same thing. If you're black in America... And if it comes out of the same thing, and they wore these tall white pointed hats. Remember I said another name for the Feast of Saturn was the festival, festival of the Lord of Misrule. Remember that? And they took a fool out here, and they put a tall white pointed hat on him. What do you think the dunce hat is? The fool that sits in the corner of a schoolroom. Comes from the same thing. They wore tall white pointed hats, this is the Catholic system of Rome. Of Rome. Let me show you some pictures. I show these every year. Show these every year. Uh, see if I got them here. Wait a minute. Here it is. Now, what do you think this is? What do you think it is? It looks like the KKK. And it's Roman Catholics. It's Roman Catholicism. 
It's in the Godfather. They were walking through the streets. Why do you think they had them on? That's priests of Baal uniforms. That's it. And if you notice, they got their kids all dressed up in it. And you can see the kids are all dressed up, and you can see the the Maltese cross. See the Maltese cross? That's a form of the swastika. And they put some black hats on. Even Mr. Edersheim says in his History of Israel, when when you go over to 1 Kings, the 18th chapter, you look at the History of Israel, he said, the priests of Baal must have looked quite ludicrous with their tall pointed white bonnets and their their white robes around them. He said they looked ludicrous while they were facing Ahab, while they were facing Elijah on Mount Carmel, saying, We're going to call the fire God from heaven. And and Elijah said, Let's let the God that answers by fire, let's let him be the fire God. And they screamed and yelled and acted like a bunch of fools all day long, cutting themselves and bleeding all over the altar. And Elijah come up and prayed about a 63-word prayer. said, Lord, show these people who you are. And the fire of God fell from heaven. When fire comes from heaven, that is the one who's truth. And fire from heaven is considered the word of God from the mouth of God's prophets, from God's preachers. That's Catholicism. It had, here's another one. These are off the Internet. It sure does look like... The clan doesn't it? The clan in Christmas and Roman Catholicism and the priests of Baal come out of the same thing. And by the way, the priests of Baal, priest is the word kahan, K-A-H-A-N, kahan Baal, and we get the word cannibal from that. And the, ca and the priests of Baal ate human flesh from their altars. And what is the mass? Eating human flesh, isn't it? They probably thought it, they'd put another spin on it. I've got all kinds of, here's some more of these. Huh? What do you mean, where did they come from? Well, the, the tall white pointed hats is supposed to be the fish's mouth. The fish's mouth. When you see, and the fish gods, you see the Pope's hat, it is, it is the open mouth of the fish. Dagon. The fish god. That's Dagon. Dog is the word fish. Dog. That's where the, and this is the closed mouth of the fish, and that's the tall white pointed hats, or the Feast of Fools. And they worshipped a flaming cross, and the cross was the symbol of Tau, or Tammuz in the ancient world, and he was a fish god, and a sun god, in Babylon. They would combine the fish gods and the sun god, and Dagon was the fish god of the of the Philistines. Let me see here. I've got here just whole bunches of them here. I've got so much documentation. Here's some in black. But it's the tall white the tall pointed hats. Let me see here what else I got. There they've even got red ones here. They just put a little color in it, I guess. To make it and it's the same thing as the clan. If you, if you find out this is paganism, nobody has any business doing it. But of all people, black folks don't mean goodness. You're putting your approval on the clan when you do that. How's that? Did any of you see that third Godfather movie? They're marching through the streets in these outfits. It's... You want to come up here and look at them? You're welcome to look at them. We'll make you some copies of them. Uh, then here. That, this looks real, real scary to me. This one right here. It looks like that face of that, uh, that Halloween face, doesn't it? Looks like that Halloween face of death. You know, it's got that big eyes and the mouth. That's Roman Catholicism. See the rosary out there? It's like, that's a good question. I guess they don't want to be seen. We know the clan don't want to be seen, so they don't get arrested. But it's the clan and Christmas comes out of the same thing. 
we are, and I've got so much more. Here's a, this is a magazine. This is a cult magazine, U.S. News and World Report. You do know about U.S. News and World Report. That's on the desk of every businessman. This is on Donald Trump's desk. This is on H. Ross Perot's desk. This is in the White House. And the chief staff reporter, this is, the date of this is December the 23rd, 1996. And the chief article was written by the head staff writer for the U.S. News and World Report. And he goes into Christmas and... He says, he says, Christmas is an American passion. 96% of Americans say they celebrate it in some form. As historians are increasingly discovering, this pure, simpler, more spiritual past is more a product of our cultural imagination than of historical fact. He says, this culture that we're involved in, this is the guy that's chief staff writer for U.S. News and World Report, political magazine. He says in it, he said, our history that we've got in Christmas is our own imagination. Do you realize how much America's brainwashed and they've got an imagination and high gear? I don't know if anybody puts out as many facts in the pulpit as I put out, and that's not even a boast. Because they don't put out nothing. Sit there and you bore you, we love God, and isn't it wonderful? God loves us all, and, and it's just wonderful. We praise the Lord for a beautiful day, and if you like to get saved and like to pray the sinner's prayer, all that's a lie. Sinner's prayer is a lie. It's not true. A series of studies suggest that the observance of Christmas was never an entirely religious affair, that many of the most popular seasonal Traditions are relatively modern in inventions. They're modern inventions. And that complaints of crass overindulgence and gross commercialism are nearly as old as the holiday itself. An affront unto God is what he says. Though most of its history, the Christ Christmas reason season has been a time of raucous revelry and bacchanalian indulgence more akin to Mardi Gras or New Year's Eve. And he didn't even know that it's the same thing as Mardi Gras among the Franks, a seven-day festival among the Franks. I've done more research on Christmas than any man in America. I don't have any doubt. Because I've studied for years and years and years. And it is every evil system of the Old Testament, everything. It's the reason God destroyed Israel. It's the reason the World Trade Center came down, because we're over there siding with Israel. And they, they say the land is theirs. God says, the land, I'll give it to Abraham. If you're obedient to me, you'll conquer your enemies, and you'll, and you'll win your wars. You'll, you'll have plenty of food. Your storehouses will be full. But if you cease to obey me and go after Baal and the grove and Shemas, which is the Christmas system, he says, I'm going to send the... the sword, the famine, the pestilence, then I'll send the beast to carry you away all over the world into captivity, and they stayed in captivity for 2,600 years over this thing that men call Christmas. I hate it. I hate to see it coming. If you think Jesus ain't going to destroy it, he, when Jesus comes back, he's going to destroy Christ's mass. Unless you're a Catholic, you don't have anything doing, any business doing it. And they're going to go to hell for it. And he says, this is big political magazine. No axe to grind with it. And he says, so tarnished, in fact, was its reputation in colonial America that celebrated Christmas was banned by Puritans in New England, where the noted minister, Cotton Mather, described Yuletide merrymaking as an affront unto the grace of God, and it is. Then he quotes Stephen Nissenbaum, describes the annual birthday celebration of Christ as a perennial battleground for com competing cultural, religious, and economic forces. There never was a time when Christmas existed as an unsullied domestic idol. It's always been dirty, and this is the book he's talking about. Battle for Christmas by Stephen Nessenbaum. Am I out of time? That's all I got to say.
Let's pray. Lord, thank you for truth. God, help us to stand during these hard times. We know that's why America's going down. You said you'd bring famine and pestilence and the sword. And we're going to hit the bottom, Lord. That's for sure. Give us strength. Strengthen the flock. We'll praise you and glorify you for all things. Lead us to your elect. Open up many doors for the ministry. And we'll give you praise in Christ's name. Amen. If anybody wants to look at these pictures, I got them up here. Hi. How has your week been? Decent.
to go in as I call you, though, right? Oh, I'm already good. I got to go over to Jim and Mary's after this. And then, um, uh, so I got another call. I got to go back out to Antioch. I got called last night. Thank you. 